Human Rights Watch released its annual report on Thursday. It accuses the Bush administration of deliberately undermining human rights around the world. Kenneth Roth, the executive director of the New York-based Rights Watchdog Group, said that the United States, quote, sordid human rights record makes it embarrassing to criticize abuses in other parts of the world. The Bush administration very deliberately doesn't promote human rights. It promotes this soft, fuzzy concept of democracy. And the reason it does that is because it's too embarrassing to talk about human rights when it's been responsible for so many human rights abuses fighting terrorism. So it falls back on, on this, this feel-good concept. Kenneth Roth, the executive director of Human Rights Watch, speaking out against abuses perpetrated and condoned by the Bush administration. Taxi to the Dark Side is a new documentary by Alex Gibney that investigates some of the most egregious abuses associated with the so-called War on Terror. It has just been nominated for an Academy Award in the documentary feature section. On December 5, 2002, Dilawar, a young Afghan taxi driver, was brought to Bagram. Five days after his arrival, he was dead. A U.S. major took the box for homicide. I said, my God, they've killed him. It became plausible to me that this man wasn't even guilty of anything, and he was murdered in detention. You put people in a crazy situation, and people do crazy things. People were being told to rough up Iraqis that wouldn't cooperate. We were also told they're nothing but dogs. Interrogators were telling the guards, strip this guy naked, chain him up to the bed in an uncomfortable position, do whatever you can. You had these young soldiers with very little training, just as the rules were changing, and they weren't told what the new rules were. You start looking at these people as less than human, and you start doing things to them you would never dream of. And that's where it got scary. It was only the night shift. There's always a few bad apples. The brass knew. They saw him shackled and hooded, and they said, right on, y'all are doing a great job. There were emails from FBI personnel down at Guantanamo saying, you won't believe what's going on down here. We've got to disassociate ourselves. You have no right to a lawyer. You have no right to witnesses. You don't really know what the charges are, and you certainly don't know what the secret evidence is against you. They saw an intentional decision taken at the height of the Pentagon to put out a fog of ambiguity. We have to work the dark side, if you will. We're going to spend time in the shadows. What starts at the top of the chain of command drops like a rock down the chain of command. American values are premised upon the notion of human dignity. We don't know what revenge is coming down the road. There will be no outrages upon human dignity. It's, 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 it's like, it's very vague. That's the trailer for the Taxi to the Dark Side, the Oscar-nominated film. Alex Gibney is with us now. He wrote, produced, and directed, as well as narrated Taxi to the Dark Side, also directed the award-winning Oscar-nominated documentary Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thanks, Amy. Good to be here. Talk about this metaphor, but also very real, Taxi, how you began your film. Taxi, um, the real Taxi, is, it's an Afghan taxi cab driver named Dilawar who was um, apprehended. He'd never spent a, life, uh, a night away from home in his life, and he was apprehended first by Afghan militia, then turned over to American troops. Five days after he got to the Bagram prison, he was dead. And uh, it was learned that he was he was killed. He was murdered by troops there. And he had simply gotten a taxi to make some money for his family. That's right. He was taking three people back to his small village in um, in, in Afghanistan, a, a village called Yakubi, and he was just on his way home and picked up. He was accused of being. Um, uh, involved in a rocket attack against uh, an American base. In fact, later on, it was learned that the very people who arrested him were responsible for that attack. The uh, amazing thing about the film is how you're able to talk to some of this of the soldiers uh, and their the uh, the the powerful way that they describe the impact of these policies from on high on the way that they did their job. Uh, talk about how you got them to uh, open up and, me, and be willing to be interviewed. Well, I think part of the reason was that some of them felt scapegoated. I mean, some of them admitted to me that they had done things that they regret that were very wrong. And yet, at the same time, they didn't understand why they were being punished and the people who either condoned their actions or ordered them. 
uh, were not even investigated, much less prosecuted. So I think there was some sense of that. I think also the word spread after I began to talk to a number of these guards and interrogators that I was trying to do something um, much more probing than um, you normally see in the nightly news. I want to play an excerpt uh, from the film. It features Sergeant Ken Davis. He was stationed at Abu Ghraib, um, Attorney William Kassara, and Specialist Damien Corsetti, who was in Bagram, Afghanistan. My interrogation training consisted of, basically, they taught us some approaches, you know, how to get people to talk. And then, here, go, go watch these guys interrogate, which were the people that we were replacing. Um, for about, about five, six hours before I did my first interrogation. Damien was picked for this job because he's big, he's loud, and he's scary. That was his qualification. Soldiers are dying, get the information. That's all you're told, get the information. People were being told to rough up Iraqis that wouldn't cooperate. We were also told they're nothing but dogs. Then all of a sudden, you start looking at these people as less than human and you start doing things to them you would never dream of. And that's where it got scary. Excerpt of Taxi to the Dark Side. Uh, tell us about these men. Tell us um, about Damien Corsetti. Uh, tell us about these soldiers that go through your film, what happened to them, how they got there. Well, uh, the soldiers that I interviewed were uh, interrogators and also military police from Bagram. Uh, and some of these people were the guys who were responsible for uh, killing uh, the taxi driver, Dilawar. Others had interrogated him. And uh, they they were the beating heart of the film, because uh, initially, I, I think uh, one is not terribly sympathetic, considering what happened to poor Dilawar. And yet, over the course of time, you see the horrible position that these kids, and many of them are just kids, were put in. They had no training. Um, and they were forced to do things that, ultimately, they've come back and, and, are, and are deeply haunted by. It's, it's not something that they ever signed up for. And so you see how that process worked. Uh, as one person says in the film, they, they were engulfed in what was called a fog of ambiguity, tremendous pressure to get intelligence, but almost no training and no guidelines. In fact, the guidelines were purposely removed, Geneva Conventions and so forth. What do you mean? So, well, the, the idea, the, 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 the word was spread. Um, down low, and that's one of the interesting things about talking to these guys, is that uh, they were told there's the rules, the old rules that used to apply, the Geneva Conventions are no longer in effect. This was in Afghanistan, and there were a number of rules coming out of the Department of Justice through the Office of Legal Counsel um, that tried to indicate that perhaps in Afghanistan uh, the rules no longer applied, Afghanistan was a failed state, and that ambiguity continued even on into the war in Iraq when, at least according to some people like John Yu, uh, you know, the Geneva Convention should have been in effect. So. Uh, in the field, the message was clear. The gloves are off. Do whatever you need to do to get information. And a lot of military people were deeply upset by this because there are, you know, very clear rules and guidelines that the military has in place in order to forestall and prevent these kind of abuses that we've seen. But the administration, the civilian administration, was taking a very different attitude toward these rules and regulations. And, and what happened uh, to the uh, to the men involved in the actual? Uh uh, beating and death of of uh, of this uh, Afghan driver. Um, some were acquitted. Some were convicted. Some pled guilty. Uh, some served prison time. Some were demoted. Um, no officers uh, were ever charged. Only the enlisted man. And um, it's interesting. At the end of the film, you know, there's a there's a law that our Congress passed with the urging of the president called the Military Commissions Act. One of the things in that law is a um, would a, amounts to a get-out-of-jail-free card for members of the administration who may have condoned or enabled some of the things that these lower-down soldiers were convicted for. Uh, you have John Yu in your film, the University of California Berkeley law professor. Explain his significance. Well, John Yu worked for the Office of Legal Counsel. And I would say that in the days after 9-11, when Dick Cheney said it's time to go over to the dark side, which is the other part of the title 
um, John Yoo was a very can-do guy. He was the guy who had a lot of theories about executive power and the idea that the president, at a time of war, as the commander-in-chief, can do virtually anything. And so he began to churn out opinions in the Office of Legal Counsel that govern what the executive branch in its totality can and can't do. But these opinions went way over the line, as, as many people are recognizing now. One of them was the so-called torture memo, in which he basically defined torture out of existence, pulling obscure language from medical statute to try to um, uh, come up with a rationale for why the only thing that could be considered torture was something that intentionally resulted in death or organ failure. Well, that doesn't leave much room for anything, uh, heck, you know, anything else. So, his position at the time? Office of Legal Counsel. He for, was in the Office of Legal Counsel. For a while, then, he became a favorite commentator on the Lair News Hour until, until more of the information on these memos came out. We haven't seen him around on the Lair News Hour too often lately. <laughs> Were you surprised by your nomination for the Oscar for this film? Uh, I was uh, elated. Let's put it that way. I mean, this was a very difficult film to make. It also became very personal to me. Um, you know, I included a clip of my father at the very end of the film to whom I dedicated it. He was a naval interrogator in World War II. Um, and he was really deeply upset about what was going on in Abu Ghraib and the news that was coming out about other abuses, because he felt, as a naval interrogator in World War II, that he was standing up for a higher ideal. He got good intelligence. He didn't have to waterboard anybody. Uh, and so I included him in the film, and I dedicated it to him. So after a long, long struggle making this film, it was a tremendous um, pat on the back, if you will, or a tremendous vindication to have it nominated for an Oscar. And do you have any plans to make any strong statements if you win the Oscar? Well, uh, we'll have to see. I mean, there's uh, the Oscars up, um, uh, you know, in the air at the moment because of the Writers Guild strike. But I certainly intend to make my presence felt if I get up there on that podium. How long did it take you to make the film? About a year and a half. Throughout the film, uh, there is this sense of the connection between the deaths, um, the Afghan driver. You talk about the pulverizing of his body. They told these young soldiers to, what, soften him up? In effect. I mean, part of the problem is what uh, Alberto Mora, the former general counsel of the Navy in the film, calls um, forced drift. Once you take away rules and regulations, there is a well-known and documented process that goes on in the human mind where you go further and further and further. When you don't get information from somebody, you apply greater and greater levels of force. Um, these kids were taught one control measure called a perennial strike, which was a knee to the thigh. They did this on poor Dilawar over and over and over again until his legs were literally pulverized. Uh, in fact, the medical examiner said that his legs almost certainly would have had to have been amputated uh, had he lived. So, you know, you can see how one thing leads to another. Alex Gibney, thank you very much for being with us. Congratulations on your Oscar nomination. Let's just hope that the writer's strike is resolved uh, happily so that the Oscars can go on, but more importantly, so that the writers can have their respected position. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alex Gibney is director of Taxi to the Dark Side. This is Democracy Now!, produced by Mike Berkshire, Fabio Cadu, Sarah Monte, Angela Comet, Jeffrey Hagerman, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Robbie Karen, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagero, Peter Curry, our engineer. Special thanks also to Becca Staley, Hugh Grant, Samantha Chambly. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.